<laughs> Welcome back to Inspector Tool Belt Talk, everyone. Today we have on a special guest, a repeat guest, Nick Ramico himself. How are you, Nick? I'm doing well. So Nick just showed me around his uh, amazing garage with all his cars and carts and wagons and some of the biggest wrenches I've ever seen and walls and walls of them. You want big and... wrenches? Hold on. I'll give you big wrenches. <laughs> I make up some wrench where I lack in other areas. <laughs> There's some big there you go. You got some wrenches that'll uh, that'll take any bolt off. Some more maybe here. Some more. You met the guys. There you go. Well, today we're having Nick on, not to talk about wrenches, although that would be a great podcast. But we're going to talk about um, being profitable, building wealth, wealth management, and things that Nick knows about. And Nick, if I could. Um, this is going to sound like a weird question, but I'm going to, I'm just trying to set you up for why you're qualified to talk to us about this kind of stuff. What makes you qualified to talk to us as home inspectors about building wealth, wealth management, profitable businesses, and things like that? Um, wow. That's a good question. Um, I, I, um, I used to ask this question of myself, sort of low self-esteem. <laughs> that probably helped me because I always didn't think I was doing well. But after a while, you know, like I, right now I run 14 companies that I started myself and all of them are profitable. Some are not very profitable, but they're all profitable. So, I mean, certainly there are better financial guys out there in the world than me and, and people have, you know, I'm not Jeff Bezos, but I did okay for a guy who dropped out of high school. So and I think that because, you know, I didn't learn to read until late, I was born poor, inherited nothing, um, and dropped out of high school, I probably have um, a viewpoint on business that may be different than someone else who, you know, who graduated with an, with an MBA, like my wife. <laughs> yeah. My wife has four business degrees and an MBA. So we look at things very differently and um, maybe what I can um, shed some light on is, is from a different angle than most people, I would say. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And I remember we've bonded over the fact that both of us are high school dropouts. I think you made it a half a year longer than I did. I was about I halfway I... through ninth grade. Oh. So. <laughs> oh, oh, I beat you. I, got tw I made it to 12th grade. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yeah. You got me way beat. Yeah. And then I, and then I dropped out. Yeah. Yeah. I should have dropped out in 10th. I'd have been yeah. two years ahead, you know? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so um, I do think that you bring something to the table that... So like my brother has a has a master's degree and he understands business very well. But when he speaks to me about it, it's like we're talking two different languages. I own multiple successful businesses and he and he owns a successful business. But it's like it's like he's speaking Chinese, I'm speaking Portuguese. It's just two different languages. But I think the language that you speak, speak um, is more understandable to us as home inspectors because we're, we're down in the nitty gritty and okay, this is what business is from our perspective and not necessarily, not, not that it's good or bad, but from a, from a college education, maybe Jeff Bezos, he kind of Elon Musk view of how things work. Uh, a lot more um, bootstrap, I guess would, would be the good expression for it. Bootstrap business mentality. I mean, I don't have a lot of three syllable words in my in my speech, so um, you know, I wasn't very good in in high school when I was dropping out. So I probably you're probably talking to someone with an eighth grade education, and, <laughs> so and that's okay. If you, if you can't understand me, maybe you're too smart. <laughs> well, and you do break it down well for us. Uh, you put it into the everyman's terms, so that I think. Um, I'm going to, I could only guess at how much money you have with 14 successful businesses. You have Internashi, um, you helped pioneer the inspection industry. So I think you're very well qualified to tell us on how to become profitable, how to build wealth and wealth management, but you yeah, said I mean, something interesting. My, you know, my money was made in profitable businesses. Um, you know, I didn't hit the lottery. I didn't, I didn't win big on Bitcoin or anything, but to this day, you know, it's mostly profitable businesses that are generating everything for me. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's parabolic 
um, in business. If you keep them running, you know, you get more and more each year out of them. So um, the longer you can keep working, the better, you know, yeah. hope to live long hope and make a lot of money. Yeah. So uh, I do want to caveat our conversation here. Um, sometimes we equate money with success and that's not always necessarily going to coincide. You said something interesting about a mutual friend that he has all that money and he gets lonely. Um, so we want to, we want to make sure that we build success. And when, when we make our businesses profitable, we, we, we kind of keep all of that in perspective, but you said something interesting about home inspectors, the home inspection industry, rather, um, a week or two ago, maybe longer than when we were talking one time, that's very hard to become very profitable as a home inspector without growing your business. Uh, in other uh, words, yeah, you, so, you, you hit a ceiling. There's, a, there's only there's only so much you can make with your own two hands unless you have mm -hmm. some crazy, weird skill like Tiger Woods, right? Tiger Woods can make a lot of money with only his his own two hands. What does he do? He builds walls or something? I'm just kidding. Yeah, so he, uh, he's a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what do all what do all rich people have in common who who make a lot of money? They have employees. You know, I have 112 employees. Hmm. Um, that's about where I should be. I like to be around 100, so I can at least know everybody's name. You know, and a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. um, if you get, you know, I'm not a person that can run a thousand employee company, but regardless of where you are, you know, one employee or, or a thousand, um, you, there's generally some correlation between the number of employees you have and how much you make. You know, you're not going to make, like I said, a lot of money with your own two hands. You might make a good living, but it's difficult to get rich doing that unless you're Tiger Woods or, you know, some musician or something. Yeah. You're going to need people. So I remember you saying that in, a, in a, even a previous podcast, and we actually opened this up to inspectors to ask questions, and we got a lot of questions. So, so some of them are very similar. And that was actually one of the questions I think Juan de la Cruz, him and a couple of others asked that. I'm at the point of scaling up. In other words, I've grown past where I, I'm doing things on my own, and I want to hire employees and grow a business. Mm -hmm. So his basic question was, how do I go about that? How would you recommend a home inspector scale up? Well, um, you probably have to start thinking about delegating when you scale up. And so I wrote a book called Scale Up, believe it or not. Yeah. You can download it for free. I have it on my shelf. Okay. So it's, um, I think it's at certifiedmasterinspector.org slash scale. You can just download it for free, and it gives you like over a hundred what uh, things you need to do to scale up your business. But um, mostly, you have to be willing to delegate and accept B plus work. If you're a single operator, you're probably used to doing A plus work on everything, and you're doing the best um, you can every day, every hour. You're going to have to forget about doing that anymore. You're going to have to be satisfied with B and B plus work from your employees um yeah and that's never, a... never going to be you and you're going to have to get over that mental hump i would say is your biggest problem i think that's a beautiful point because um i think that's what prevents most home inspectors from hiring and growing their business like this call center doesn't answer the phone like me uh this inspector right. doesn't inspect the roof like you you're not going to get you so well, eventually not lowering your standards, but accepting acceptable work that's not going to be as perfect as yours is, mm -hmm. is the way that I think I look at it. Matter of fact, Mike Ortiz, he asked a question. He's hiring his third guy, so he's able to do that. And he actually mentioned that, you know, accepting that no, nobody's like you on one of our previous podcasts. And he's heading into his fourth employee this year. He's done really well. He's about two years in, two and a half years in on his fourth employee. He says, what's the best way to move forward and prepare my company for that transition? In other words, going from little, you know, owner run to how do I, how do I grow bigger as I go into my fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh employee? Like you're at a hundred and some odd. How did that work when you 
when you started to grow? So, um, for me, I have ADD, so it worked out really well because I just kept going to other, <laughs> into other businesses that I found interesting. Um, I would say the, as you grow, you know, you have to have infrastructure behind it. It's just like a city. A city can't just start slapping up buildings and bringing in people. It has to have bridges to get in and out and, and road systems and water systems and all that. So he has to give some focus to not just counting how many heads he employs, but what those heads do. So you're going to need someone in the office to start helping. You're going to have to have managers underneath you. Um, you know, if you take a look at the, um, the operations that you're familiar with, with me, um, CCPIA, for instance, it's run by Maggie. You know, without her, I could, there's no way I could run that. I don't run it at all, in fact. She runs mm -hmm. it. So, you know, CMI, IEC2, the insurance companies, the, the uh, Cozy Codes for Kids, you know, Internachi, the House of Horrors, um, all these things, um, they operate with someone in charge as well. So if you're getting a three and four, I think you're going to have to put someone in charge. It can't be you and four Indians. It's going to have to be you, someone right underneath you, and three Indians. If that makes any sense. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I see a lot of companies when they get to that number of employees, that that's what they do. They have like a lead inspector and he runs the inspection team and then you have an office right. person and then yourself. I've always said every time you hire an employee in an inspection company, I plan on losing three quarters of a day per employee. So... Um, you know, checking the reports, right. working extra to get inspections, managing people. So by the time you get to five, six employees, you should really only be doing an inspection once in a while when there's an emergency and just keeping an eye on things, running your business. So that makes a lot of sense uh, at that you gotta, you gotta point. you got to pick a mini you too, you know, you got to pick somebody yeah. who's right underneath you and have yeah. them doing your stuff. Because if you have to manage a bunch of people and still do your stuff, yeah, uh, that's not delegating. Yeah, and it does, and it is, um, it does seem hard to do sometimes. Like maybe it's like we're digging a ditch and we stop to go rent a an excavator. Do we lose time to go rent that excavator? Yes, but when we come back with it, it works a lot better. So we may lose time and money hiring a mini me, so to speak, to yeah. run the company, but eventually. Now we can have six employees with that guy running them and we're free to grow the company. That makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, I think I told you one of, one of the reasons I think I'm financially successful, you know, more, more wealth than I ever dreamed I'd have is, with, is because of I have low self-esteem. So despite my personality at Internachi, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking that I'm probably not right about what I'm thinking about. And so that gave me a big advantage when I hired managers because when they wanted to do it their way, I didn't say, no, 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 you're going to do it my way. I was, I thought instantly they knew better than me. <laughs> and that's, that's a big advantage you, that, that most, most businessmen who've been successful on their own don't have. They think that they know the best way to do things. And um, you're probably wrong about that. Let, mm -hmm. let, not only delegate stuff down, but also delegate your authority and, and keep your mouth shut and see what they do, even if you, it looks kind of strange to you. Their experiences in life are much different than yours, and they might have a different way of doing it. And it turns out it's a much profitable way, much more profitable way to do things. And that was that is really hard for most people. And, and it turned out it's very easy for me because whenever I see someone – attaining our goals in a, from a different angle. The first thing I think of is that I've been doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Most people think they're doing it wrong. And you can only, uh, you can only have this big advantage that I have through low self-esteem. <laughs> <Low> self <-esteem. laughs> <laughs> if you believe you're an idiot, but truly believe you're an idiot, like I did for many years, <laughs> You have a you have an advantage over someone who truly believes they're a genius. So um, original quote, though, by the yep. way, I'm I'm going to put that one in a book. Yeah, 
everybody, uh, business success, wrap up this whole podcast. Think you're an idiot and you'll succeed. <laughs> but um, basically, it, it comes down to, have you ever heard the Dunning-Kruger principle, Nick? You know, I don't. I, I don't. I don't read books, so I, I am not. So I, I don't read books either, actually. But um, the Dunning Kruger effect is these two guys, Dunning and Kruger, did an experiment. They found that nobody actually knows where how intelligent they are. So people either way overestimate their skills or way underestimate their skills. And ironically, people that are terrible at something because they have no benchmark for how terrible they are think they're awesome. And then people who are actually awesome understand so much about it that they think they're stupid because how could they actually know what everybody else does about that subject? Well, it's even worse in my case because I got rich early. Yeah. And, and I got rich a couple of times, right? And so just like everybody else in my neighborhood who thinks I'm smart because I have money, <laughs> you could actually believe it yourself. You could You could start to think that, I must be smart because I have money. There's some joke about some guy playing the lottery and then he wins and then he's, you know, he wants to tell everybody out, you know, advice on how to win the lottery and how smart mm -hmm. he is. If you, you know, stick to it and buy a lottery ticket every day, you too can win, you know, and all this nonsense, right? So mm -hmm. you have to be careful. You don't, you know, get, you don't become full of yourself as you get rich because yeah. then, because then you're not humble anymore and 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 you start to think that you know best when certainly you don't it's very unlikely you 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 know the best way to anything yeah. it's very unlikely that i think that's actually a deep thought from our discussion that uh there, there is a lot of humility that goes into into it other people know what we don't know and the more we can step back and not necessarily have low self esteem but be humble and say Maybe they can do it better. Let's see how this plays out. Or maybe just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong. Interesting. So let's say we are working and we're scaling up. Another question that was um, that was added here, are, are you opposed to debt? And I think a lot of home inspectors are thinking, well, if I want to keep up with this big company, maybe take on some business debt so that I can grow faster. And, that you know, it's like venture capital. A lot of big businesses do that kind of thing. Or do you think it should be more bootstrap? Um, well, I prefer it. I prefer it be more bootstrap, but you know, I'm not opposed to debt. That makes a lot of sense um, in an inflationary environment where there's mm -hmm. a lot of inflation. I mean, any, anybody, you know, we all know this now. We all know Dave Ramsey was wrong, right? Yeah, we all totally. Know people, we all know people with 2.75% mortgages, right? sitting on them when inflation's at, well, they say it's, it's, it's four, it's really like eight. Yeah. We're sitting on a, a real inflation rate of, of about 8%. So we know, we all know he was wrong, dead wrong, made a mistake. Um, so, um, I'm not opposed to debt. It's, um, but there's some satisfaction in, you know, paying for everything, I suppose, without borrowing. Mm-hmm. It might be a spiritual reason also not to borrow. Um, I think the only, you know, I'm not religious, but I know the only time like Jesus kind of got violent with everybody and kicked some butt was with money lenders. Um, there also might be a psychological um, reason not to have a lot of other people's cash on hand because mm -hmm. you feel flush when in fact you are not. So you're, it's, an it was an advantage to me to always have low, like a low self esteem, and always feel like I'm struggling. I always felt, up until very recently, that I was struggling to make it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, borrowing money tricks some people into thinking that they're not struggling. Hmm. Um, you have to be, uh, you have to be very wary of your own brain. <laughs> Your own brain can be a real enemy. And so you don't want to trick it into thinking in a, in a way that could hurt you. And so that would be my opposition to debt for some people. But on paper, absolutely not. Financially, debt makes so much sense in many situations. Um, so 
before we get into too much on whether someone should borrow to grow their and expand their home inspection business, you know, you have to start thinking about that first. You know, you also don't want to borrow money for no reason just to grow big. You know, size doesn't matter. Bottom line does in business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unless you're, again, trying to raise money, <laughs> which is a form of borrowing, a form of debt, right? Mm -hmm. Don't worry about how big you are. Um, worry about how profitable you are. I have, very, I have some very small businesses that have no employees that are outrageously profitable. Um, so um, we see that the human brain wants to be big. Um, mm -hmm. We see this when they design their own brochures and their own websites. You go to mo a lot of home inspection companies where they, the, their wife and and the husband designed their own website and designed their own brochure. The name of their company is taking up all the precious real estate. Mm -hmm. they want, you can, you, they're revealing um, the problem with their own brain that they want their <laughs> so big on the above the fold of the website, their company name. They want it real big on their inspection vehicle, even though it doesn't say home inspection on it. So you don't even know what the what the darn company does unless you have a uh, glasses to see, you know, underneath the word home inspection. Um, so they, you know, they trade all their precious real estate for ego to satisfy their ego of being big. Instead, they should be using that precious real estate to sell their services and explain to people what they do and why people should hire them. That's a perfect, and I see that so many times that it, it's, it reveals to me that most people or most home inspectors certainly, you know, focus on being big instead of profitable. You know, that's, that's another deep thing that you just said there. Um, I remember this one home inspector was bragging about how many inspections he did in a year and how many I, employees he had. Yeah. I've, and I said to him, I'm like, save some time and do it. Yeah. Well, my, my question to him was share yeah. your, share your net profit. Yeah. He shared his gross numbers. I'm like, how much of that is net? And not that he was going to do it in a public forum, but I knew him personally. He goes, Ian, it's not going so well. I didn't want to share that number. I'm like, then why are you bragging about all yeah. the number of inspections? And if you're not, exactly. you know, you could have a, you could yeah. have a third of the size of the company be more profitable. If you ever go to one of these events where there's stools, they're not chairs, there's stools that are about three foot tall. And there's guys sitting on stools, five of them in a row on a stage. And they're telling you how much they grossed. Uh, this is usually a bunch of crap, you know, <laughs> I want I want to see the profit margins and I want to see your bottom line. Let me, let me see your bank accounts. Don't show them. Tell me how many inspections you did. Cause if you did a bunch of inspections, you know, a lot enough to be on stage bragging about it and people mm -hmm. like this, right. And, uh, people in the audience sit next to their wives with pen and paper. If you're in, if you're in one of those situations, and you haven't made any money, you're not really making any big money, you've harmed our industry. You're the, you're my enemy. Because hmm. all you did was churn and suck inspections out of the system through the skills you had to acquire inspections, but not to acquire, acquire profit. Hmm. You're, you're the most, you're the biggest enemy in my industry. I would love to just crush you out because you're stealing jobs and wasting them. For someone in a, to do thousands of inspections and not end up rich, that person didn't go uh, out into an, an enormous cornfield and pick, and pick enough corn for himself and his family. He burnt large swaths of the cornfield down so that nobody can eat. He took those jobs and wasted them, stole them from other inspectors who could have made a profit out of them and did it thousands and thousands of times over and over for years. And at the end had nothing to show for it. And all he did was harm us all. That's my biggest enemy in this industry. It's within, it's not without, it's not an R. Yeah. It's that idiot sitting on that bench on stage telling us how many inspections he did without revealing, without showing me his house. Show me your paid off house and then we'll talk. I'm mm -hmm. gonna see that first. Let me look at your house. Let me see that it's 
how, how much you owe on it. Then go up on stage and tell us how you did it. Otherwise, I, I suspect a lot of these guys are just stealing work from everybody. When you do a job and you don't make any money off, off of it, you're a thief. You're, you're a thief to my industry. Unfortunately, I, I think most of our listeners would agree that it's not just one or, or a group of five guys doing 10,000 inspections each. It's a lot of us that are single inspectors or you know smaller companies not making a profit. I talk with guys all the time and they're like, oh, I have to compete at 350. So and then they wonder why they can't make their bills, but they did 600 and 700 inspections by themselves. They worked their ass just, off. Yeah. They worked for nothing. I did the math with this one guy at the end of the year of how many hours he spent attaining the inspections, getting ready for the inspections, driving to them, doing them. He was doing three a day. He ended up making just above minimum wage at the end of the year. He's working, you know, 100 hours a week, seven days a week. He didn't even have a vacation that year, he said. And I'm like, go to McDonald's. I'm like, go. Uh, that's a lot easier job for minimum wage. Less stress, less liability. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we get, I think what you're saying is very true because we get in our own way. So, but let's say now that we're one of the inspectors where we do well and we make profit. One of the things that I struggle with is I've always been very good at making money. And then it, it sits on my desk, proverbially speaking, as a paperweight. I'm like, oh, hey, look. And then I move on to the next thing that interests me and I want to go do this. I, what does a home inspector do with money after he has it? What would you tell him to do? So, you know, one of my, I think of things in like, in terms of battles, right? So one of the, one of the enemies in finance is cash mm -hmm. because of the United States has so much debt. That debt has to be serviced. I think they're running up a debt of what, a, a trillion dollars every hundred days, hundred days or something. No one's buying our notes. So they have to print this money. All this printing of money, and it's worldwide. Every currency is doing it right around the world. It's fiat, fiat currency, yeah. Fiat currency is going to zero, as it always does. It's just going globally. Every it's all going to zero. So with inflation, you know, you have to. If your profit margin is fifteen percent, and there's eight percent inflation, you're only making seven percent because you're fighting upstream against inflation. So without, you know, getting into too deep, you know, into it. And I wrote, a, I wrote an article on it. It said, uh, nachi.org slash wealth, how inspectors can store wealth. But basically you have to buy things that you can touch in general. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't touch it, you know, it's not there really. And so I think um, there's a whole list of things you can buy. And some is with just a hundred dollars, you know, like maybe you should go buy groceries now in store and because they're going up, you know, groceries went up 40% in, in four years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it goes all the way up to, you know, something where you can spend a lot of money to try to put hedge inflation, but you have to get rid of your cash. I'm, I'm sitting on some cash and I would love to, I would love to deploy it and I can't find opportunity. I mean, the, the real estate market is high where I'm at. The stock market is, you know, all, all time high. PEs or ratios are crazy, right? Gold uh, broke, uh, you know, four or five all-time highs in a row last in the past mm -hmm. two weeks. So I don't know where to deploy cash really, um, and I don't think I'm alone. I don't think uh, probably probably other people with cash have the same problem, and that's why that's why the market is as high as it is, and things are as high as they are. I mean, we're having a commodity bubble right now. I mean, planet Earth has two things that it's sort of swimming in. <laughs> It's swimming in oil, <laughs> mm -hmm. more oil now than when they told me in third grade that we're reaching peak oil from now on, we're going to ne never find any more. So we have more oil reserves now than ever before. It's, an, it's a planet of oil and it's a planet of cash. We're swimming in it. There's cash all over the mm -hmm. place and, and no place to go. Um, and I'm not sure what to do about that completely, but you have to get into a variety of things that you can touch. Um, I would say, you know, right now, if I, if someone had forced me to deploy money, I would say I would buy um, mining stocks, I think. Hmm. Miners at least pull something real out of the ground that's going to be needed. 
you know, whether it's lithium or copper or silver right now or gold, those stocks are basically selling for the same thing they sold five years ago. It's the only thing that didn't go up. It's the only commodity, precious metals are the only commodities that didn't go up. Um, they just started to go up recently and um, this, the, um, the mining stocks behind them haven't really budged much. They got a long way to go. So if you're asking me today, I, I would say go buy some Newmont Barrick or, or some, if you want to get into a junior mining stock and try to, you know, get a 10 banger out of it, if you want to take a little risk, do that. I, those are very undervalued. Um, and silver is still very undervalued. You know, it's not even close to its all time high of $50 or something. It's only hmm. coming up on 30, right? Despite every other commodity going through the roof. So, you know, it's ironic. You're the second person to tell me that recently mining stocks. I might have to, I might have to listen to that and go get some, but I do find, um, that question comes up a lot with business owners in general, not just us as home inspectors of where to put our money. And we're always told things like, uh, you know, do um, uh, mutual funds, like a lot of people do, like places like Betterment and all that stuff, or awesome. high yield savings accounts. You should have at least six months, they say, or a year of uh, your life expenses and in, in like a high yield savings account, like Goldman Sachs or something like that. But I mean, you can what, you can get pretty good interest rates now. You can get four point eight percent to a bank. So um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's not. But it's that's not just a, keeping up with inflation, really. Just we're barely losing a little bit to it. Yeah, losing. Need any money? But you have to ask yourself other questions. You have to ask: Am I going to need cash in the future, or in the near, in the near future? Mm -hmm. the answer is no. Then you got a problem because you got to figure out what to do with this money, right? Yeah. Um, so you've always been a proponent of gold, but like physical gold, like the old Ron Swanson adage of burying gold in a box in the backyard next to the oak tree where nobody can find it. <laughs> well, I mean, you just said why. You just explained one of my reasons I like gold is because, yeah. you know, someone once said, well, can't they find, can't the government find your gold? I said, I don't think so because I can't find some of it. <laughs> I'm 62, I forgot where I put it. <laughs> But um, you know, it's it's the only it's the only financial instrument that has no third party counter risk to it. There's no nobody can take it away from me. Nobody can lose it. You know, you mentioned other things like four hundred one k's and stuff like that. I'm not interested in that. I, I, I you know, I have money in the stock market, but I don't like. I, I don't want too much of it in there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a trader. I'm only trading in and out. You know, constantly. You see me on Internet's message board. I announce some things I buy, and then you see me dump it like in two days. As soon as it goes up, I dump. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a trader in and out, but, you know, because that's not wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, wealth is something that you, that you have to, that should, you should be able to um, touch, I think. Um, and, you know, maybe real estate's for you if you're less worried about the government. I mean, the government knows where real, your real estate is and they know you can't move it. So it's kind of on the front line. If you're if that if you're sort of a you know anti government conspiracy theorist like me, <laughs> <laughs> you know I have a lot of real estate. I have fifty five properties, so yeah. I'm not against real estate. And then, um, but it's the it's the stuff that's most out front, right? You, you can't pull it away on wheels, <laughs> can't mm -hmm. hide it, and they can tax the crap out of it, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And probably on the other side of that, in between, and it's everything in between, would be gold. So it's small, it's indestructible. If your house catches on fire and it melts, it melts into gold. I mean, it's just, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a you know, monetary instrument. It's used in everything. Silver is really going to be the big one. Silver and copper, I think. You know, if they really get this, you know, electric, electrification of the world going, you're going to need a lot of silver. Yeah. And, well, Europe, um, is, Europe is already there's, there's not much mostly there. Uh, UK. Right now. So, a lot, a lot of them are already there for the electrification. So, um, okay. So I, I do like the physical asset thing. Um, I have a hard time with real estate sometimes just because of the tax thing. I live in New York and we're highly taxed. Oh yeah. So, and, and really when it comes down to it with few exceptions, like over the past few years, real estate as a whole just keeps up with inflation. So if you sell, if you it buy house, yeah, it pays rent. Well, if you're renting, oh. yeah. 
Well, it does, it does three things at once, right? So real estate is a special kind of thing because it does three things at once. Um, first of all, it pays a dividend every month. I mean, every, you know, last week was the end of the month for me, so I got a stack of checks, right? I mean, every, all the rentals pay income. And that rent goes up with inflation, just like anything else, right? So it's a hedge against inflation, right? It's a tax deduction because you can do, you can say like Donald Trump does, right? You can say that your real estate is, is going down in value on paper, despite it going up in value in reality. That, whoever wrote that, I don't know, who, I, don't know I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about legislative history, but whoever came up with that idea, <laughs> I mean, to, to be able to say that this property is going down in value while in fact it's going up in value, that's mm. a big, that's a big tax saving. So that's number two, right? Dividend, you get a dividend every month, you get a tax right off. And then the third thing, the thing itself appreciates. So it's a double hedge against inflation, right? Because the rents are going up, but then the thing is going up with inflation. So, I mean, there's a reason most people who got really rich on their own did it with real estate. And it's because of those three things. Hmm. You combine those three things, there's nothing that touches it. Gold doesn't pay a dividend, right? Yeah. And, and, I, can, and I can't depreciate gold. So it only has one of the th three things. Some things have two of the three things. This has all three. It's, you know, it's mm. an, real estate ama is amazing. Well, I have a lot of it. So, Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good point. And I'm not exactly a real estate guru. I just never had a, had a stomach for renting properties. But it is a little bit hard right now because um, real estate's so high. I mean, a house down the street from me sold double what it was, what it, what it was purchased for just five years ago. I'm like, what in the world? Double. Yeah. I mean, so four years ago, the average, you needed an average seller of like $59,000 to buy the average house in America. And mm -hmm. today you need an average seller of 103000 Exactly. So some, you know, it really went past inflation, didn't it? It, it? it flew. Well, and there's a housing shortage whenever, that's, that's economics 101. You don't have enough of something, so it becomes more valuable. So... <laughs> And I think that's the I think that's the government's secret weapon. What they're really doing, right? They have this big debt, and there's only three ways of getting rid of this big debt. We can pay it. Well, we can't. <laughs> I mean, if you took all the tax receipts that came in, tax receipts dropped five percent this year, by the way, already. Mm. So you know, compared to last year. So if we gave them all the money we earned, we still we can barely service this darn thing. It's growing so big, right? So we can't pay the debt. The second way is to default on it. Just tell attorneys too bad, you know, and everybody else, social security recipients, sorry. You know, we just can't tell a military, you, you just, you, I'm sorry, you just can't attack the wrong countries anymore. You know, when, when the Saudis uh, hit us on 911, you can't go attack Afghanistan and Iraq and spend 20 years over there. You can't do it. It costs us $9 trillion to do that. No more doing that anymore. You're going to have to call Nick Ramico and he'll send you a 95 cent map of the Middle East so you can actually go retaliate from 911 the way you should have with surgical strikes and got out. You can't spend $9 trillion over dollars. That's defaulting, right? Tell them, okay, no, you're cut off. Social Security recipients, you're cut off. Medicaid, Medicare, the Chinese, everybody has our notes. You're all done. We're defaulting. We've defaulted before, so it's not a big deal. But they're not going to do that. There's no way. No politician's going to do that. So the only third way to get rid of all this debt, and the one they're doing, is to inflate it away. Basically, add zeros hmm. to everything, and then the debt becomes worth uh, the, the debt becomes only one tenth of the, its size. For, it's just a ba basic math. If you did that, right? So, how do you cause inflation? Well, one is to print a lot of money, which they're doing, right? You know, they're never gonna. They, they act like they're trying to get to two percent. They're never gonna get to two percent. They have no intention to. They want inflation. And what's the other way to ca cause inflation? In increase demand. So let millions of illegal immigrants in. Every one of those immigrants has to eat and, has, and needs a roof over their head. You put that pressure on it, inflation, inflation goes up. They want, despite everything they say, whenever the government's saying something over and over, and you got the, you know, the chairman of the Federal Reserve on 60 Minutes, what's he doing on there, on TV show? <laughs> you know, a couple of times a month. You know, he, we, should, we shouldn't even know his name. He should be insignificant to us. But whenever they're on there saying they're trying to get rid of inflation, it's because they're trying to create it. 
And there's, it's, they have a clear motive to. They ran up the debt, they have to deflate it, inflate it away. Inflation is a tax on everybody, and it's a sneaky tax because everybody votes for it, <laughs> not knowing that they're paying it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, like, I, it's like corporate tax. You know, everybody say, oh, we've got to get these corporations to pay more tax. No, that's a tax on you. Corporations, I have a lot of them. I have a lot of corporations. They're just three pieces. I have to show you them. They're just three pieces of paper in a file cabinet. They can't pay tax. Corporation can't pay tax. It can only collect in a, in a form of higher prices and pass it on to bureaucrats. It's a sneaky way of taxing you. It's just the same way as when I hire an employee and he says, well, a lot of taxes came out of my paycheck. Well, you should see what I had to pay to hire you. It's a sneaky, that money could have been yours. It's a sneaky way of taxing you. Corporations don't pay tax. People pay tax. So if you raise a corporate tax, you're, you're taxing us in a form of higher prices. If you vote for certain people, <laughs> um, you're taxing yourself with higher inflation because it allows the government to print money. And do they give it to you? No, they spend it on themselves and you pay it in the form of groceries. Yeah, there's so, there's a lot of complex. Yeah, there's a lot of. Way. And there's a lot of complex parts to that issue, but inflation is definitely something that affects our decisions of what we do with what money we have. And to go back to the debt thing, I do uh, I do tend to think that some debt is good. Like, I think if you're going to buy a house, even with a higher interest rate, buy it and refinance when the interest rates go down, because then you end up paying back if you buy something for $500,000 in 10 years, that money's worth less. So now you're paying back money that's worth less to, to pay off that debt. So that the dollar is, is now worth that, 80 cents. That, so that is a hedge against inflation. Yeah. So again, as inflation goes up, Dave Ramsey gets more and more wrong. Because that, that, that's a, that, that is, um, that is who benefits inflation. In fact, inflation is basically a transfer of wealth from savers to borrowers. Think yeah, of that. Pretty much. So if you're saving money, you're losing it. The purchase, you're, losing, you're not losing the money nominally, you're losing it in purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And the borrower is paying back the debt that he, he got all that purchasing power to buy a house, and he's paying it back with dollars that are more and more worthless. Yep. So he's the winner, the saver's the loser. It's a transfer of wealth. Inflation's a transfer of wealth from savers to borrowers. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Yeah. If I could, um, to get back down maybe to a couple of the questions, I know you didn't want to talk about the NAR thing, and we don't have to talk about that, but it does bring up a question from one of our inspectors here who wanted to know, basically, if it's not that, what's the biggest threat to home inspectors to the industry? What are your well, thoughts on that? You mentioned the big, a big one is inflation. Yeah. You know, if you go to the you know, Inspector Museum in Boulder, Colorado, which uh, you know, we started, um, in there – um, our inspection reports. And some of those reports have the invoices from when they did them in the 70s and the 80s, right? Those invoices don't look terribly different. Yeah. Than, um, today's invoices. That's crazy. You know, we haven't really given ourselves a raise. And we're doing a much better job. I mean, we do, we do you know, photographs inside color photographs inside our reports. You know, we do all sort of ancillary inspections. We do, you know, we, we email the reports. We have insurance. We have the buyback program. We have warranties, uh, all to protect our clients. You know, we have all a variety of tools that we never had back then, infrared cameras and moisture meters. We're a much better industry than we were in 1980, providing a much better service than we were in 1980. Yet, mm -hmm. our prices, which should be six times what it was in 1980 are one and a half times. <laughs> if that, if that. Yeah. So you asked me, what is your threat to um, the inspection industry? We already talked about it. Inflation. What do you think about um, like the commoditization of the industry? Cause I think that does, I think well, there's a little bit more of that than there used to be. Do you mean like big multi-inspector firms? Not necessarily. It's more of a mentality of like, you know, you used to years ago look for a home inspector. And I remember having to compete really hard on skill levels 
where now it's the mentality of buyers of you just need to get through the inspection, kind of like you do with um, appraisers. You don't meet your appraiser. You don't ask them about a skill level. You don't ask to see sample reports. You just get whoever met the price line. They go do the appraisal and you move on. I see. Do you see the same thing happening to the home inspection industry? Yeah, yeah, but I, you know, I always look at that, and you know, because I'm looking at it through other industries. I'm in a variety of other industries that have nothing to do with home inspections, and I always look at that as an advantage. So I'm hoping hmm. the industry around me commoditizes in that in that sense. Really? Okay. It becomes homogenized and similar, and lower in price, and sort of just grumbles along without getting any real power or distinctiveness, because that's what I'm going to get. I'll be the, I'll, I'm happy to be the odd man out. <laughs> and I'm even odder, the more you guys all become the same. So I'm going to um, stand out from you. Okay. Um, you know, you know, our C, my CEO is a pretty smart kid. Um, he always says, we, we wish we had 10 ashies. They're all bumbling <laughs> around doing nothing like the regular Ashi because we would stick out really well in an Ashi. Don't put them out of business. He was always begging me, to, please don't put them out of business. We need 10 more. So if you adopted his thinking to inspectors, it doesn't really harm you that there's a bunch of bozos out there doing the same thing over and over, looking similar, because this just enhances um, and I'm a marketing guy, so maybe, you know, I'm not talking, I'm not talking to everybody. Everybody says, well, it's easy for you. <laughs> I'm a marketing mm -hmm. guy. I'll, 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 out -mar I'll do a little bit more better marketing than them. And I'll take the gravy and you can have all the rest. You can have all the potatoes that you want. I can't do it all anyway. So I prefer the 90% that I can't do to be done by those who are similar and weak. Keeps them at bay. If that's a way of looking at it. I actually really like that perspective, Nick, because um, I was wondering where you were going with that. And that makes a lot of sense. So if everybody else is McDonald's and you're the gourmet burger shop. I'm happy. Yeah. So that's actually uh, because just yesterday, the guy was just like, oh, this industry is going down. Everything is commoditizing. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. But no, that's a great perspective of well, it gives us opportunity to stand out well, as different. It's a great opportunity for single man operators. So I wrote an article, nachi.org slash get hyphen rich. And I list four ways that home inspectors can get rich. And one of them is the single man operator just, just kills it. He's just becomes so amazing. You know, he's Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways to do it, you know. And uh, I'm sure Tiger Woods would think the same. He would love to play against his whole career against a pile of mediocre golfers that never took a dollar from the, any of the money that he was going after. He'd get all the, he'd win all the tournaments and have all the endorsements and no one else could compete. Well, in business, that would be, that would be a dream. And so, the closer they become, to, they come to doing that, the sweeter my dream. Which makes a lot of sense because um, actually Peter Ganino, um, sorry, Peter, if I pronounced your name wrong, but he asked, how does a home inspector survive in an area where there are two or three multi-inspector firms getting all the work? And I guess that's the answer to the question. It's not a matter of how do I compete with them? It's perfect. The more they homogenize and kind of do everything the same, what can I do to be even better than that and come yeah, out I mean, as Tiger Woods? You have to start with everything, right? You have to clean up your whole marketing and everything to attack, to, to pull away from that, right? I mean, maybe if you're just you and your wife and, and your son doing the inspections, you could say, you know, not a franchise. Yeah. Family owned and operated. People love that. I mean, that. That tagline would cause a consumer to say, well, I don't want these franchises. <laughs> I want the family owned and operated guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, or, you know, if you're just a single man, right. And you're just uh, or a single woman just doing out there competing with multi-inspector firms and franchises, maybe your tagline would be, you know, a picture of yourself, you know, saying you actually get me at the inspection, mm -hmm. sending, uh, one of my underling employees. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Pe people want to cool. know. 
who's coming to the house? Who are they actually hiring? Anyway, when the world all gets the same, it becomes easier and easier from your marketing to distinguish. And marketing is basically a tool to distinguish yourself from others, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So you can, that accelerates the more they become homogenized. So I look at it as a good thing. I mean, now if you're just a home home, I just want to do my little inspections and get in there and make a couple of money. Then maybe you're, you should jump into, jump in with the rest of them then. You know, that would not, not be anything I would do. Your software is not that, is it? Are you trying not to what? be, are you trying to be home inspector pro and home gauge and everybody else and ISN and everything? No, matter of fact, we get, uh, we get flack sometimes because we're different. We, we want to be different. We want to stand out. Yeah. Well, they say, you know, when you're, if you're not getting flack, you're, you know. <laughs> yep. You're, you're going to get flack when you're doing you're something not right. Over, you're not over the target. You know, flack yeah. is, when the, is what hits the plane. So. Yeah. You're not over exactly. the target. Well, it's okay to be different, you know. Yeah. It's, and, it's and, a, I, just, and I do like that. Um, and and yeah, even with I our can't, software. Can't, I have no reason to. um to chalk to have a pricing to have pricing that is all my pricing and everyone businesses are considered high i can't argue that i should charge you more if there's nothing behind my argument it would be like an attorney going into a trial and say your honor i move to that you boo blah blah this and then he sits down <laughs> i'd be like well, well, well you know you have no are you supporting your are, your contention in any way in any way before i rule against you so you want to have um, you want to have reasons to charge more. I know that. I mean, this is the game. I mean, we're in here to make, to make money. And, I, and I'm, I'm tired of these inspectors saying, well, I make a good living. Well, then go get a good job. The only reason to be in business and take on all this risk and do all the things home inspectors have to do is to make a really, really great living. If you're just putting along and, you know, and, and putting food on the table. Oh, my God. Please get out of my industry. Go away. <laughs> Get a job. I don't need. I don't need an inspector who puts food on his table. If that's his goal, I wish he would go away. I mean, there there is a there is a lot to say about that. A lot, um, box because there's a lot that goes into a business that we don't think about. The late nights, the worry, yeah. the work, the advertising, the marketing. We think, boy, I made five hundred dollars in two hours. No, you didn't. It took you eight hours it's to get close. to that two hours. Why do all that for nothing? Yeah. Yep. You'd be better off working. Yep. Buddy. Exactly. But um, that that's why we have you on the show is because you're going to say the real stuff that we need to hear. Um, and it, I think we got through the bulk. We had a lot. We had a lot of people submit questions, and I'm trying to combine some of them. But um, is there anything that you'd like to add to, for inspectors, Nick, either about? Well, what was the theme of this of this interview? Basically, the theme is how how to gain wealth and profit as a home inspector, and I and I think that's kind of what we're well, we, we're well, targeting we're, here. If we're wrapping up, we didn't get into any details. We should probably do a detailed one, but you know, generally, there's a three part system to getting rich, which is to increase your income, which usually means increasing your sources of income, mm -hmm. managing your expenses. You don't want to buy boats and. Yachts. I mean, you can have yeah. an occasional luxury in life, but you don't want it all. You don't want a big house. I wanted a big house. That was my luxury, but I don't have a yacht or boats or, you know, yeah. anything like that. Um, you can have an occasional luxury. I'm not saying don't enjoy life, but you don't want a lot of them. You don't want to keep spending to keep up with your income. So increase your income, manage your expenses, and invest the rest. I mean, it's kind of like a simple three-part system. Um, a lot of people do two or three. You know, a lot of older people did the first two, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Fiscal discipline is, is extremely important. I do, you know, not to quote Dave Ramsey too much because I know uh, how your, your feelings on him, but he talked about, he's like, if you make $100,000 a year and you buy an $80,000 car, he, he says you're stupid. He goes, if you're if you're making three hundred thousand dollars a year and you own a boat, two eighty thousand dollar cars and a big house, you're stupid. He he's saying he says some of the same things that you're saying of fiscal discipline. It, well, it's the same thing we talked about earlier about the guy on stage, right? 
we want to look at his margin, right? So in personal finance, your margin is your income versus your expenses. Mm -hmm. so we want to, we want to see that uh, we want to see a healthy margin there in the same way we want to see that guy on stage talking about how many, how many home inspections he did last year. We want to see his margins is what we really want to see. Same thing with, yeah. with personal finance. We want to see a margin. And then we, what does he do with it? Don't keep it in cash as we discussed on the show earlier too. Not in this environment. You, you want to put it somewhere where it, it grows and it, and it, and it helps um, with the first step, which is income. You know, mm -hmm. I like and stocks. I love, you know, rents, things that spin off a little bit. Yeah. And I do like the fact that you went back to that point, because again, it is one of my biggest pet peeves when inspectors tell me how many inspections they do. You don't need to tell me how much money you make, but don't brag about, oh, me what? and my helper, we did a thousand inspections this year. I'm like, big stinking whoop. How much did you make at the end of the year? What, right. what was your profit margin? Because I know guys out there that charge a premium, do a couple hundred inspections a year and make more than some multi-inspector firms. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look at me. My gross revenues are not that much in all my companies, but I know how to get that margin or I don't do it. If I yeah. can't figure it out, I don't do it. You know, so you should I, focus on that. So I will say getting into some of the detail, um, let me know if you agree or disagree with this. If I if I were starting out in business today and let's say I was doing 50 inspections a year, just starting out, how many? I would 50, just guessing, okay. you know, if I was just starting out, I was doing 50. Personally, I would invest in commercial inspections because it's bigger money and it's basically the same job. And I think it's a lot better. And then you can get reciprocal income. And then we've talked about this a lot on the show. You can do yearly inspections, maintenance inspections, and a lot of those commercial inspections turn into regular income. Home inspections tend to be a dead stop and home inspections, we shouldn't stop doing it, but I think we should have a couple avenues of money. I think we should grow bootstrap personally. Every, I've never taken on any debt for any business. It's not my thing. Me either. And it doesn't, yeah. So take it from people that have built businesses. Yes, debt has its place with parts of life, but when it comes to business, it does change your brain. Uh, it, it really does. When you're doing things bootstrap, there's a different mentality in that business. Um, and it, it tends to grow organically. But would you agree with those couple of statements I said, or would you disagree? I, I, do. I think it goes back to the one, the one of the three things I said, you have to get your income up. I would have a second stream of income, which is a commercial inspection company, completely separate from my home inspection company. Always. Want, yep. Completely separate, separate websites, separate entities, separate altogether. Yep. And you'll find that that management business, because it's not a home inspection business at all. It's not an inspection business at all. You don't need knee pads. You don't have to go yep. crawl around anywhere. You're going to hire everybody almost the way I do them. You know, I, I'm a commercial inspector. Um, you you want to manage it out, especially as you're getting older. Like I'm 62. I don't know how old you are, but at, at your age and up, you want to start going towards commercial because you need a management business late in life. Home inspections is a physical business. Mm -hmm. You've got to be in great shape for it, and it'll beat you up over time. Whereas the commercial inspections, it's all a management business. It's a scalable business, and it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, desk business, which I like. I always say if you, can, if you can, try to build your commercial inspection business as if you were blinded, in, you know, accidentally blinded, so, or just put a blindfold on it. And if you can run it from your desk with just your phone, you're doing, you know, and, and unable to see very far. Uh, maybe you can just see enough to, to type your, to type of your invoice. You're doing right. I don't even retype the reports from the, uh, the, the experts I hire for each project anymore. I used to, I used to put it all, I thought consistency mattered in a report. I just now staple their report to, to mine, to my cover letters. And, and what I did on the inspection. And I haven't had a single commercial client complain about it. In fact, they like it. It appears even better because it looks like different people with different expertise worked on their inspection, which in fact is what actually happened. So I can charge a lot more. Why would I want to homogenize it and make it like I'll retype it all? Yeah. Into one report. I'm not, I'm not in a report writing contest. I'm in a money making business. Yeah. And then it's recurring income, which is, which is important for any business. It's so big, it's B2B. It's B2B. I like. Yeah. B2B is good. Yep. That's, a, that's yep. extremely important. A lot less 
drama. Um, I also find that other ancillary businesses help. A lot of very successful home inspection companies start pest control companies. And again, that's recurring income. You're out at that house once every six months, every sure. every year, and you can run that from your desk. You have the inspection, you finish it, send it off to your pest company, and you move on yep. to the next inspection. Water treatment. It's almost part of almost no SOP in most states in the U.S. So water treatment systems, radon uh, installation companies. I was talking with a home inspector yesterday, started an environmental company. And he doesn't he doesn't cross over with his home inspections and that. But you know what? Somebody needs a radon mitigation system. Guess who they call? One of the uh, Ukrainian um, refugees that I took into my house to to get him out of the war and out onto the street, started his own filter business. But you can imagine how many filters there are in a house. <laughs> I mean, between mm -hmm. your water filters and your furnace filters and everything. He goes around and changes all the filters. Because actually most of them on his truck, the rest of them in his warehouse. And it's a heck of a service. It's repeat business. You know, he only needs like 150 clients to get actually, I figured it out, to get actually, he doesn't have that quite yet. But to get really, really wealthy the way he's doing it. Um, because they just give him repeat business. He comes back every few months and, yep. and changes and all the filters, and he knows what filters they have. Like, do you really know when you get ice out of your freezer, you know, do you know what size filter that is or even where it is? I do, but I'm weird. Yeah, okay. Most people don't even know. <laughs> furnace, yeah, most people. Furnace filter sizes or the last time they changed it, right? So it's a really great um, business. It's attractive to to people with who are more affluent, mm -hmm. you know, um, so, and that's, and that's why I guess I'm pointing out too, it's not overcomplicated things, but we have access to the client first and we can, we right. can build off of that. So like the water treatment company, I remember water treatment company charged me $90 to come tap their finger on the top of the timer and say, oh yeah, that's still working. Dump two bags of salt in and they were gone in five minutes. I'm like, that's a glorious business. Glorious. Glorious. I mean, the initial setup and everything, you might need your best guy to go do that. But then after that, have your 18-year-old nephew just starting out working in the summers dropping salt into people's water softeners for $90 a pop all summer. I I, I gladly pay because I'm like, listen, I'm not going to go drive to Home Depot, get 20 bags of salt, drive back, dump all this salt in, spend three hours doing it. I'm like, it's worth it to me to just have somebody do it, you know? So... Anytime we can do that, I always find multiple streams of recurring income is always going to be the best. And that's an unfortunate part of home inspections. No recurring income. Right. People have steady, tried it. Steady clients is a great, any business that has regular clients is a great business. Yeah. You know, um, you can sell them, you can re, upsell them a lot of stuff. They trust you over time. You trust them over time, mm -hmm. which is also have a relationship. Right? I don't want the crazy clients, so I, I want my good clients. And um, a, a book of business is why insurance companies get rich. It's not because they sell insurance. It's because they resell insurance. <laughs> well, have you ever watched The Office, Nick? There was that one episode I where... TV. I don't have a TV. Okay, I, TV. I love TV. I don't watch it. All right, I love TV. It's kind of like TV raised me. So, um, But there's this one episode where this guy's in business school, and he asked a question on the show, is it more... Pro is it is it more profitable to keep an existing client or to get a new one? And he was just quizzing them. And the answer was, it was, it's always better to keep an existing client than acquire a new one. Home inspections. We have a great business. It really is like the coolest life ever driving around, right? seeing cool things, meeting cool people, but we have high acquisition costs. And then yep. we never see that client again until they sell their house in five to 10 years. Yeah. Or worse, we acquire, we acquire um, an agent who, gives us work, but um, because there's 2 million of them chasing 5.1 million deals, you know, the, the average real estate agent can only give us two or three a year. Well, and a lot of them are going out of business. Some are freaking out about the NAR thing, going out of business. So now what if 10 of our 20 agents that refer us go out of business? Well, we lost half our work. I'll say this. They never had a business. Well, yeah, when, when, exactly. When your average real estate agent makes $30,000 a year gross before expenses and taxes. Yeah. It was, it was, it, there was never a business. Yeah. Again, it's one of these things where they're just sucking money out of the system and not making any profit with it. Now there's a few exceptions, of course, 
in any industry. There are a few exceptions and there are realtors that do really well for themselves, but the great vast majority of them don't feed themselves on that. Yep. You know, they're probably married to a spouse who's, who's really carrying the load if they really broke it down and, and looked at where the money's coming in, coming out, you know, looked at the wear and tear on their car, their marketing costs and everything to go get those three deals done a year on average. Oh my God, yeah. they never had a business. We, uh, we, at least, we at least have a business that we, we don't charge enough for. It. Yeah, that's they exactly what we business. They're not even doing enough volume. You can't. There's only two million. There's only five million deals. Out of a real estate transaction, I would say the home inspector makes the most money on average per hour because, you know, the attorney works. Attorneys in my area charge $500 to $1,000, but they're working lots of hours and employees yeah. and stuff like that. Agents not making much money. The the appraisers not making much money. Yep. Yeah, and uh, the, the agent definitely makes the least. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's their office fees and splitting yeah, the commission the biggest, eight ways. It may look like the biggest check, but it's actually a really bad business. You know what yeah. I mean? No, I agree. So if you're a home inspector listening to this, you made the right choice. And to sum up Nick's um, expression earlier, uh, we need to think we're all idiots and we'll all succeed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. but It worked for me, and, uh, and my thought process may have been accurate. Who knows? <laughs> no. Nah, no, you've done really well, Nick. And Nick, at... As always, great podcast, and I know we didn't. We could go on forever talking about this, but I think this gives home inspectors a good idea of um, where to go from here, um, so to speak, of um, how to start maybe tweaking our our thinking is really what it comes down to is what I'm gathering from you. Not necessarily what we do mechanically. Okay, if I do X, Y, Z, this will work. A lot of we it should, comes down to our thinking. We should get into the mechanics on another podcast. Let's do it. I'm I'm down with that. As you can see. Yeah. Get the wrenches out. Yeah, we'll get the wrenches out and get on the nuts and bolts. That's what I'd rather do. Okay. Let's do it. Thanks. Thanks, Nick.